episode 249. Brent's great at involving the whole, the whole team. And I actually like doing that process. I like coming up with ideas. I like the challenge of trying to make things better, trying to make this the best shop, you know, that, that it could possibly be. That's exciting to me. We're starting to run this business like a business and not like a mom and pop organization. It's being run like a business. This is the right thing to do. I know that the sales will get there. And I, I became his coach. <laughs> you know, he kept going. He's like, man, he said, you're, my, you're the cheerleader now. Welcome, aftermarketers, to Remarkable Results Radio. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Welcome, aftermarket professionals, to episode 249 of Remarkable Results Radio with my guests, shop owners Brenda and Brent O'Neill from Repair One in the Woodlands, Texas. Hey, thanks for hitting the play button. Carm Capriato here, your host. Happy to bring you another service professional husband and wife partner interview. This episode is brought to you by Federal Mogul Motor Parts. Search for parts, get the latest technical updates, and sign up for the new Garage Rewards Loyalty Program at fmmotorparts.com. Did you know that every podcast episode has a show notes page, and it's on my website. There you'll find additional bio information, pictures, web links, and logos when available, and most important, a summary of the interview, typically the talking points that were discussed. You can find this week's show notes with Brenda and Brent O'Neill at remarkableresults.biz slash E249. Hey, so glad you can join in on the power of the podcast and the unique stories that are told each week. I hope you've discovered your favorite listening app as you travel, commute, and exercise. There's also a free Remarkable Results radio listening app available on Android or Apple. Just go to the App Store and search for Remarkable Results Radio and install. And at your fingertips, find all the episodes, including the Academy series. Hey, and speaking of the Academy, that is your weekly podcast of a single subject topic discussed by your industry peers. Now find every Academy on your favorite listening app or on the website. This is a great opportunity to hear about or learn about the trending topic and get perspectives from your industry colleagues. Hey, let's get social. I love it when you connect with me on Facebook like Michael Johnson, Scott Felzer, and Robbie Sire. And to my new LinkedIn connections, Michael Ferris, Ron McElroy, and Mark Higgins. Hey, thanks. Now to find all my social connections, email and important Academy links, go to remarkableresults.biz slash social. Now meet my guests, Brenda and Brent O'Neill, owner of Repair One in the Woodlands, Texas. I love to interview partners, especially husbands and wives. Now, neither Brenda nor Brent had any experience in the automotive world when they decided 24 years ago to open Repair One. They've grown a great business, yet, as Brent says, he's always looking to stretch his goals further. A few significant points to listen for is how well Brenda and Brent work together. They each have their own specialty area to focus on in the business. However, to finalize their plans, they collaborate and decide together. This episode is packed with great insights and wisdom. Brent shares his plan on how he likes to grow his general service techs into top-notch A technicians. They also suggest that hiring a business coach was one of the best moves they ever made. They share some insights on this. Also hear them talk about the power of integrity and trust that anchors their business culture. They also speak to the entire team's responsibility to ensure that their customer experience is the best it can be. This six-day-a-week shop was honored as the Wix Shop of the Year in 2015. Now, a lot to learn from Brenda and Brent O'Neill here in Episode 249, another great husband and wife aftermarket partnership. Now, here we go. Nice to be with Brenda and Brent O'Neill from Repair One Automotive in the Woodlands, Texas. Good morning, Brenda. Brent? Good morning. Boy, husband and wife. The salt of the earth in the automotive aftermarket. Glad to have you here. We had a great pre-call. I loved your story. I just loved your story. And Brent, it may have been you who said to me, we have a perfect balance. Yeah, I think so. Um, You know, um, Brenda, she's great uh, at keeping keeping me focused, uh, not letting me get tied up in the minutiae of the day-to-day stuff, you know, because Mrs. Jones's car or 
or what happens with the piece of equipment or whatever tends to grab your focus. And she keeps me focused on moving the business forward and, and uh, move, keeping that, you know, keeping me focused on really what I need to be focused on, which is not the day to day operations, but more making our business run like a business. Look at things like planning and uh, scheduling and getting things going uh, so that, you know, so that we can see the long term growth and kind of get where we want to go. So she sometimes keeps an eye on the bigger picture. It keeps me from getting stuck on the day-to-day, which is easy to do. And, you know, uh, my wife and I worked together a while back, and people would come to me and they said, how can you do that? Brenda, do you get that a lot? Yes, we do get asked that quite often. Uh, Both of us do. And uh, one time, one of Brent's friends said, man, how do you do it? You spend so much time together. You work out at the gym together. You go to church together. You work together. And we've managed to make it work. Um, there was some little bumps in the beginning, but we've been doing this together about 12 years. And uh, we, I think we, like Brent said, we have a great balance. So we each have our own strengths. You know, and I think that's the secret. I just couldn't help but think that's how my wife and I were able to do it. And we each knew our roles. And Brent, you basically explained that in the beginning. I know what I've got to do. Brenda lets me do it. What does she have to do and what do you let her do? I let her do all all the marketing. She likes to do that. She does that. I mean, we both get involved in the decisions and how we do it, but that's primarily uh, primarily her focus. She does a lot of the the office management, but she stays away from answering the phones and working with customers and working with technicians. Although all the techs love Brenda, they all want to go talk to Brenda all the time. But, uh, but, uh, you know, she does, she stays away from the management, that part of it. Um, she stays away from the sales part of it, uh, keep, you know, parts and all that stuff, just the, the stuff, the day to day stuff. Um, she stays away from that. She doesn't want to be involved in that, which is great. And like I said, she just, her focus is, is the bigger picture, uh, all the time. That's pretty much what she does is like, okay, if our sales are at X, how do we get them to Y? So Brent, what did you do this week to get us from X to Y? Or you haven't, you know, you said you were going to be doing this checklist and these things and you haven't been getting those done. So it's sort of like having an in-house coach, but a little more demanding than a regular business coach, but, but uh, kind of an in-house coach, keeping me focused. Keeping, Brenda, do you work full time? No, I don't work at the shop full time anymore. There's times when I go in full time, but right now I, I try to keep it to two full days. Sometimes I go in three or more or four. Just depends on what's going on. Is there a lot you can do at home? I do do some things at home. Yeah. I find it fascinating that you don't have a background in being a technician. Um, Brent, you were a stock broker. Yep. Wow. Uh, so tell me about that transition. That's uh, exciting to hear. Uh, most of most of everyone, as you well know, Uh, was the greatest technician in the entire county, and they started a business. And you said, hmm, I'm in money. How else can I make some? Oh, I'll open up a repair facility. Yeah, I think not being a a technician is really a huge advantage, uh, which every other person owns a shop that was a technician would think it was a disadvantage. And I think it's because I've always said technicians are a lot like artists. Uh, They think that they can paint a picture, AKA water pump better than any, anybody else. They all believe they are the best. I fix a car better than anybody. Uh, you know, I can do this better than anybody. My mentality is we all do the same thing. We all fix water pumps. And if it comes in leaking and it goes out and it's not leaking, we all did the exact same job. No one did it better or worse. The only difference is how it's perceived if it's better or not by the customer. And so I keep my focus always on the, the customer experience. I, I had uh, interviews with my employees one time and, and I asked them, I said, what is, your, what is your primary responsibility at Repair One? And, you know, in, invariably it would be, oh, to fix cars. And I said, no, nope, that's a job duty. Tell me what your responsibility is. And they'd say, well, um, it's to make sure I don't have comebacks. I said, no, that's a job duty tell me what your responsibility is. And they start thinking now and they go, okay, well, get it out as quick as I can. I'm like, 
No, those are duties. I want to know what your responsibility is. And then finally, they're like, I don't know. I don't know. And I said, your responsibility at Repair One is to make sure the customer experience is the best it can be. And everything you do has got to be around that and making sure that the customer experience is the best. We all can fix a car. We can all do a water pump. We can do brakes. We can do a timing belt. I said, but we don't, our totem pole is never straight up and down. It's parallel to the ground because nobody is above another. I said, because if technician A does a timing belt and a water pump, does brakes, uh, does about three or four flushes and all the maintenance, and it's a $2,000 ticket, and the guy that's changing the oil leaves grease all over the handle, or the, not handlebars, but the steering wheel, uh, or on the fender, what was that customer experience? They leave disappointed. So everybody has the same responsibility and we're all equal on that totem pole. Everybody's job is just as important as the next person. The, if the technician does his job incorrectly and the service rider does the greatest job in the world, it doesn't matter. And vice versa. If the technician does a phenomenal job on it, the GSs that are doing the cleanup and making sure it's pulled around, but then the service rider disrespects them or doesn't pay attention to them or doesn't give them the attention they need, it doesn't matter how well they fix the car. So it has got to be a team effort. So the responsibility of everybody at Repair One is making sure the customer experience is the absolute best it can be. And if you focus on that, then you're not thinking about fixing cars. So when you were having that discussion with your techs and they couldn't quite get what you were saying, were you really attempting to build and improve and create a very strong corporate culture that's focused on the customer. Was that kind of uh, the day that you said, "Hey, we got to we got to get over that that hump"? Yeah, because the point, the, what two things we want to create is that culture that the customer is really the most important thing. When they're in there, it doesn't matter if uh, Miss Jones is a real pain in the rear. She comes in and she always is demanding. Or we have one lady that comes in, she puts plastic over her seats and her doors because she's just kind of anal. It's, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Each one of them has got to have a great experience. And if we're all on that, then it becomes a team effort. And then therefore we all have the same responsibility. Then, then it's not a technician telling the GS is, Oh, here, quick, pull this car around and do this for me and do that for me. It's all because we're working for the same exact goal, which is to make sure Miss Jones has the best experience when she comes in. And so what I find is then the technician. Will say, hey, well, I was here. I found a way that the GS can do this, or the GSs can come up and say, hey, Brent, I found a method, uh, you know, that might work better. And so we can all incorporate ways, you know, for our processes that can be fine tuned. It doesn't matter whether it's a tech, you know, an L1 master technician or a GS, they can have good ideas that can help make our processes better. And so we want to have, you know, foster that environment where everybody's valued. Everybody is on the same team, and we're all working towards the exact same goal. I'm talking to Bud Houston, a technical product specialist with Federal Mogul Motor Parts. Do you actually put products in the hands of the technicians? Yes, absolutely. Anytime there's new product introduced, perhaps a new problem solver or a new technology, uh, we keep that stuff on the van just because uh, their local parts supplier may not have it available, and we think it's important to show them what's coming and then Seeing the part is really, especially with the new OEX, seeing the part and touching the part is something that, that changes perspective rather than just a piece of paper with a picture of the part. Okay, so you put an OEX pad into the hand of a technician, and you've done this, I'm sure, hundreds of times. What do you see on their face when they see it? You can, you can tell they get it. You know, in, in, in our industry, there's technology that, that we use all the time that you look at and you're like, that just doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to take your word that it works. You put an OEX brake pad in somebody's hand and I just ask the question, why does this look so weird? And they're like, I bet it's to make it cool. They get it as soon as you put it in their hand. So technicians holding your product and listening to your presentation, do you ever see the light bulbs go up? They raise their hand and says, boy, I've got a great idea for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Not only do, do, does that happen, Every time I'm with a group of guys, I solicit ideas. I'm like, listen, a lot of the stuff that I've shared with you originated in a bay somewhere where the technician said, you know what, if you could do this, it would be really cool. And so the stuff that I get, I send up you know, uh, to our engineering team and say, hey, could we do something like this? And there's things in, in the works and there's some things that came out recently that, that originated in, hey, if you could do this, it would be helpful. Because at the end of the day, 
you know, I think federal mogul is known in, in every line to be a problem solver and not just solving a problem, but making an installation easier as well. Federal Mogul Motor Parks' Garage Gurus is your go-to source for the vehicle training, technology, and answers you need to keep your next job on track. On-site, online, or on-demand, the gurus are here to help keep your business and your career on the road to success. Visit fmgarageguru.com. You got the formula there on, on how to make sure the customer's the pinnacle in your in your company, and I loved everything you just said, and it got me to ask a question about quality controls. Do you, do you have a very strong QC process? You know, we, we're really fortunate. We run a, a really, really low comeback rate. We're probably doing a, 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 about 2% on comebacks. Um, and so it hasn't been much, but one of the things that I think we're going to try to, we have to focus on probably is, and Brendan, and I've talked about ways that we can, uh, do better quality control to make sure that uh, the little things, you know, like, uh, grease on a fender or on a steering wheel, uh, we haven't really implemented a good plan in doing that. And that's something we probably need to, to focus on in the future. It hasn't been a problem. Uh, it, and, uh, I've, I've never had complaints that things were done because we've got some processes in place about, you know, how to clean it and who does what. But probably a way to go back and check that is probably something we need to Yeah, we, had a, we recently did an Academy episode on QC, quality control. And I just encourage anyone who's listening to get to the website or if you're listening to it uh, to us on a smart app, just search and you'll find a quality control. A great episode, great ideas that came out of it. Brenda, um what Brent just said about, you know, working with Brenda on these ideas, how, how, how do you collaborate? Give me, give me some ideas on, on how exciting it is to, to sit with Brent, get some ideas and vice versa, and then together saying, yeah, we need to do this. I think we do really well at that. We um, sit down usually in the office and we'll come up with ideas on the check, the final delivery of the car and making sure that the, the car is, um, perfect for the customer and, and how that delivery process is going to work. And Brent and I will bounce ideas off of each other and make up a plan. I'll type it up. It'll become part of our policy. And another thing I'd love that Brent does is he'll, he'll get uh, feedback and buy-in from our service manager and our service advisor so that, you know, if they're on board, then the processes will work and we'll get it. it it'll start becoming part of our, our operations. But, um, Brent's great at involving the whole the whole team, and I actually like doing that process. I like coming up with ideas. I like the challenge of trying to make things better, trying to make this the best shop you know that that it could possibly be. That's exciting to me. The Woodlands, Texas. Uh, you had told me you guys totally disagreed with people saying never open a business in the town you live in, and, and I and I love that. So tell me why that's important and tell me a little bit about Woodland, Texas. Well, the Woodlands, I've often said, is kind of like living in Disneyland. Um, it is a, a master plan community and it's one of the most successful in the United States. I mean, it's, they've tried to replicate it uh, numerous times. It's uh, about 120,000 people live in, in the Woodlands. So it's actually very large. It's, it's, it's become its own city. Uh, and so, uh, so that they don't get annexed by Houston. So it's really, uh, it's just a really large area. Um, and it's, um, uh, they, Houston is known for not having any kind of zoning in Houston, but the Woodlands does. So they'll designate areas that are commercial. These areas are for parks and so forth. So it's a real neat area. It has a lot of community feel to it. There's a lot that's going on between concerts and music and, you know, you'll be riding bikes at night. There's bike paths everywhere. So your people are always out mingling, going to concerts and uh, music, dinner, restaurants. I think, I mean, there's, I forget how many hundreds of restaurants there are, hospitals. I mean, so you don't really have to ever leave Houston or uh, the Woodlands. It's kind of like its own little miniature city. But what is really cool to me uh, is running a business such that whenever I've had new service writers come in, they'll say, oh, uh, Mr. Jones comes in. You might want to deal with him. At, it's, he's one of your friends. And I'm like, no, he's just a customer. Uh, and then uh, after a while, I'll start noticing every other day they're telling me, oh, so-and-so came in. I wanted you to talk to him because he's your friend. And I finally didn't, I had to figure out, I'm like, to the service writer, I'm like, no, no, no. These people are my customers, but they become my friends because they're my customers. And so I don't know them outside of work, but I do see them at 
concerts and I do see them at restaurants and it's always great because they're always they're they'll come up to me they're waving it hey Brent how are you doing you know or how's it going and so it's it's just awesome to be able to see these people uh, in a non-working relationship and and see them smiling and coming across the crowd to greet me because they see me behind, from not behind the counter because they're my friends what a testament it's almost like the proof of your business culture and your focus on the customer continues to show up wherever you go. Yeah. It, I, like I said, I had people tell me when I first got into this industry, you know, 25 years ago, never live where your, sh- your shop is. And they would say, Oh, you don't want those people. They're mad at you. And you know, they're going to be upset and you'll see them in the grocery store and everything. And I always thought that was a weird comment. I, I just didn't understand it. Maybe I was naive, but I absolutely would never want to have a shop that wasn't where I live. I I think it should be, it's the only way it should be. Yeah, I agree with you. Now, you told me you built your building in the woodlands and uh, did you guys have to conform to a certain look because it's a beautiful looking building? Oh yeah, they they dictate what kind of bushes, uh, what color brick, uh, how many accent rows, how many feet they are, how large your signs are. Uh, yeah, it's, um, and they have a lot of pull, uh, with the state legislature. It's kind of interesting when you do state inspections, you have to have the state issues a big sign and it's a pretty large sign. You have to put it on your building. And, um, the Woodlands was like, uh, no, we're not putting that big sign on the outside of the building. And I'm like, well, the state says I have to. And they said, well, don't do anything. We'll get back with you. And about a week later, I had a special made smaller sign that was delivered by the state of Texas. So they said it, they, <laughs> the woodlands actually got them to approve smaller signs that go in the woodlands. Well, there's some political power right yeah. there. Yeah, for sure. Marketing, Brenda, do you handle it all? Pretty much. I mean, like Brent said earlier, we work together on what we uh, finalize and decide to do. But I like coming up with a master plan and, and deciding, okay, uh, we're going to do this direct mail piece and come up with a design and 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 do the the postcard mail outs or the things that i like better though are when we can advertise locally with the local high schools um we have a couple of online uh websites in the woodlands like woodlands online or interfaith directory and they're very active in the community and so we advertise on there so it's been uh a learning curve trying to and and continuing trying to decide what what works the best you know where Where's our money best spent? Um, but I like that part of it. It's, I think it's what, where the teamwork comes in, though, is Brenda doesn't really have a background in automotive, and she doesn't know what goes on um, in the back because that's not what she does. So what's great about it is she's always looking at different ideas and, and she's like, Hey, will this work in our business? Or, Hey, is this a good idea? And a lot of times it, you know, you get stuck in doing the same types of marketing, uh, the same types of ideas that other shops have done. Well, Brenda will bring a lot of ideas and we'll sit and talk with uh, our service manager and we're like, no, that one won't work. Or, wow, that's a great idea. We wouldn't have thought of that. So it brings things that are outside of the box that are outside of the norm because she, she doesn't know what works and what doesn't. So she's just bringing ideas and, uh, you know, again, kind of bouncing them off us. And then we can kind of all work together on what will work and what won't. Is Facebook working for you guys? We like Facebook. Uh, we have a following, but Facebook is a challenge. If I do it by myself, then it takes a lot of time and I'll forget or, you know, I won't be consistent. And so trying to find a company that does marketing for Facebook has been a challenge. We've, we're working with somebody right now and I think it's better than the last person that we had or last company. But even with that, I want our Facebook to be a little more personal. So. I think you have to be involved as an owner somewhat with Facebook. I don't know that it can be outsourced completely and be successful. When, when I looked at your uh, company profile, something that stuck out, and that was the number of training hours you're providing for your technicians and your service advisors, 50 hours a year. Pretty impressive. Um, I hear 40 a lot, but 50 is, is great. You paying for training? We do. Uh, the only the only requirement we have for the technicians or anybody is is I'll pay for the training unless they don't show up and then it comes out of their paycheck and they know that up front and that's agreed upon that I'll pay for it if they'll but if they don't go and they don't 
show up for the training because I don't get a refund, then then I deduct it out of the technician's paycheck and we have full participation. And part of some of the times, you know, a lot of times you want to get, you always want to get buy-in. And so I let the guys a lot of times say, hey, look, here's a list of what's coming up. That was been our, that was our focus this year. Um, last year, our our main focus in the business was getting all of our equipment updated and back up to speed and getting everything where it needed to be. This year's focus was going to be on training and uh, getting all the technicians where they need to be. Um, though we have a couple of guys uh, uh, that were older, and of course they have a tendency to want to keep doing things the way they've always done them. And so, uh, basically, it was like, well, training this year is not an option. So now you have this much to do. You pick and choose the classes you want to go to. I will pay for them, but it's mandatory. You have to go. Brett, do you keep a resume and pretty much know what your technicians have taken? And will you look back in three or four, you know, three or four years and say, hey, you haven't gone to this class in a while and I'd like to see you get one? You know, I haven't only because we haven't focused on training as much as we have until this year. Got it. Uh, and so this year, you know, we've been focused on it more. Uh, but um, so I probably I haven't kept that because it hasn't been something we focused on as much in the past as we have done this year. What I find also interesting is that you told me that 35 percent of the training is leader led and 60 percent is online. So are you finding all the good online courses it depends on the technicians. One of the things that we've done is we've always worked with our general service technicians and tried to integrate kind of an apprentice program where we're always moving one of them into uh, the area of becoming a technician. And so for them, uh, online training works great uh, because it allows them to go sit back in the back office for an hour and say, okay, um, here, I want you to, you know, the basic fundamentals of A, B, or C or whatever it is, because there's plenty of basic fundamental training uh, for, uh, technicians, but I found that guys that are really, uh, like an L1, uh, they pretty much things that are online, they've got to do leader led, uh, because they want to be involved. They got to be more hands-on. So I think it depends on the type of guy you're sending. Uh, you know, the, the GS is we want them. One of the things that we do is all of our general service technicians, they, I mean, you know, yes, they do state inspections and they change oil, but what I do is I pay them for a flag hour. And so in addition to what they get paid on their clock hour, because I want them to focus on production. Uh, so everyone that is in the shop is paid for production, uh, not just clocking in and clocking out. So if they're, if they're clocked in and they're mopping the floor and changing the oil, well, they're going to make their base hourly pay. But if they want to make more, then they need to you know, check out vehicles, learn to in, improve their skills. And so they can go online and, you know, say, Hey, just electrical charging systems. How do you go through all the checks? What are the things they can do that online very quickly? It's very efficient and they, it helps get them up to speed pretty quick. Got it. I understand. So in 2015, Wix awarded you with the shop of the year. How exciting was that? It was so uh, exciting. Yeah, really. It was, we were kind of blown away. Um, I remember Brenda, was on the phone. It was like at about nine o'clock at night, one night. And, and I hear, and, and she's got this perplexed look on her face and, and, and she's talking to someone and I kind of look over and I'm like, who are you talking to? And she mouths to me, we won. And I went, what? And it said, well, we won. And, uh, and so she's talking to him so, and I'm like, what do we win? What do we win? She goes, and she's like, shh, 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 you know, and I'm like, what, the, what are you, what's going on now? I'm really interested. And, and so she goes, okay, so what do we got to do? So we go to a dinner and, um, and, she, and they says, oh, we get an award at the dinner. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, okay. So well, we go, go to a dinner. And so Brenda goes, so, where, so where's the dinner? Is it a restaurant here in Houston? And they said, no, it's in Las Vegas. And I'm like, oh, there's the catch. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> You're thinking that they give you this yeah. award. You got to fly to get your award. You got to fly. And they're going to give you a special good. deal and stay at our hotel. And it'll cost. I'm like, how much is winning this award going to cost? You know, Isn't that strange how we think about stuff like that? <laughs> oh, I know. And so, and then Brenda goes, okay, so it's in Vegas. So when do we go? And, and she goes, uh, no, we've never been to SEMA. And, and so the next thing you know, they're like, no, Brenda, I said, so how much is this going to cost you? No, it doesn't cost anything. I said, wait a minute, there's no way we got a free trip to Vegas. No. I said, what about the airfare? No, they're getting our airfare. I love it. And I'm like, you're kidding me. I think I have just discovered that you must be the bottom line guy in the company. 
Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> what's this yeah. going to cost? What's this going to cost? I mean, you know, obviously, you were preparing for Brenda to negotiate on your behalf. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good, that is a good deal. So we ended up staying at the what was it the Venetian? Oh, Venetian, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Venetian, it was yeah. a great trip. Yeah, it was great. I'd never been to SEMA and uh, learned yeah, a lot. Yes. Yeah, a lot of it was a lot of good classes. Learned a lot of good info. And are you going this year? Uh, we will go again. I don't know if we're going to go this year, but uh, yeah, it was it was really good. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there with a podcast studio. We'll be there then. <laughs> we have to go. We'd <laughs> love, to love to see you there and come and sign my alumni poster. Oh, that That's would be awesome. so great. Hey, um, I, I, uh, I'd love to find out about entrepreneurial hacks, you know, kind of a cool little secret idea that someone figured how to get through life with. And I loved your answer. You have a business coach. Wow, how powerful. And, and, and I really do want to find out your, 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 your deep thoughts about that. But it seems out of all the interviews that I've done as the voice of the aftermarket, I find that 98% of every successful service professional has had a business coach. Again, it's kind of like what we talked about with marketing. One day, Brenda was, she goes, I think we need to do this. And I never thought of, I never even just never entered my mind about a business coach. I, you know, who's got time for that. Uh, and Brenda goes, no, I really think we need to do this. You need to look into it again. It, for me, it was definitely outside the box. Um, and, uh, you know, and I'm probably the most skeptical uh, of all about doing it. But I thought, well, you know what? We need to do something different because we got to the point where we had reached a plateau in our business uh, from a growth standpoint, sales standpoint, everything just kind of reached a plateau. It was okay, but it wasn't at that level we wanted to be. But at the same time, I remember think I remember telling Brenda, I don't know how we're going to get to that level. You know, we want our sales at X and we're stuck at Y and how do we get them there? I just... I, I just didn't know. And, um, it was probably, uh, it was one of the best things we ever did. Cause it was just, it, it allowed us, uh, two years later. I remember the first year we got in the business coach, uh, at the end of the year, we spent a lot of time, uh, fine tuning a lot of our processes and a lot of, uh, uh, fine tuning, uh, setting up, uh, manuals and getting that stuff done, which is important. Uh, set a lot of things, uh, in, in progress that we're, that we're working and our delivery process and how do we just down to stuff as simple as how we greet customers, how we answer the phone um, and all that stuff. And I remember at the end of 12 months, I remember our, our sales were pretty much uh, level. They hadn't really improved. And our business coach was really, he was kind of down about it. And he goes, this was the first seat ever. And I said, I told him, I said, look, I don't even care because what we're doing is the right thing. We're, we're, we're starting to run this business like a business and not like a mom and pop organization. It's being run like a business. This is the right thing to do. I know that the sales will get there. And I, I became his coach. <laughs> you know, he kept going. He's like, man, he said, you're, my, you're the cheerleader now. So you were really saying, you know, as hard as we're working, um, it's going to happen, but we had to do all this other stuff first. We seemed to, like you said, plateau yeah. and did all of a sudden, boom. Oh, yeah. Yes. We, the next year we were up 25% the next wow, year. See, it all worked. It was like you were yeah. you were putting the epoxy in the, uh, the hardener yep. in the epoxy, right? Yep. Well, yep. And I remember when we first uh, started looking into getting a business coach, one of the questions they had us do a profile to see who to match us up with. And, and uh, I remember saying, you know, our numbers aren't bad. We're a successful business already, but we feel like, like what Brent said, we're, we've reached the, the most we can reach by ourselves. And we just couldn't figure out what do we need to do next? And um, we weren't really disappointed. We didn't go in with a business coach strictly to raise our sales. We wanted to make the whole business, you know, reach its potential and, and continue. And so it wasn't, um, it wasn't just about numbers for us getting into that. And so that first year when things didn't just boom and take off numbers wise, that was okay with both of us. And then we started seeing the, the sales go up and everything that was being put into place working and, and that, you know. Of course, that was great. <laughs> what was in your gut, Brenda, to convince Brent that you had to do this? What were you feeling about it? Um, I love, I, I'm kind of a planner and I, I like setting goals. That's just who I am. And 
So I always am pushing like, um, we, we can reach the next level and we, we can do better, but, but we need help. And so when I, I saw this uh, um, elite as who we use and their uh, information, I just told Brent, we need to do this. We need to, we need some help to reach that next level. And, and he was for it as long as I found it and got the ball rolling. He was, he was jumping right on board. So you all, you both took a 50, 50 equal responsibility to make this work, right? Yeah. Yeah. For yeah, sure. I mean, it's a, it's a financial commitment. I mean, it's not like, you you know, you get someone that just says, hey, will you help me? I mean, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a big, it's a big decision uh, financially for, for a business to do it. And, uh, uh, but I've, I've, I've recommended to several other owners since then, I'm like, you know, I, I've, you got to do it. I remember one of the, uh, a guy from another shop asked me one time, he's like, he's like, Brent, how do you do that volume? I mean, how do you do that? He says, I've got two more techs than you do. You know, we had, we had more techs, more service riders, and he was doing half the volume. He goes, how do you, and he said, we can't get it out. He says, how do you do it? I said, it's just getting the processes in place so that you can always work efficiencies and you, everybody can work and get in, maximize what they can do. And I said, that's what, that's what a business coach does. I mean, they help you look at that type of stuff the key with a business coach is finding that right match with your personality and elite did an excellent job matching us up with uh, Kevin. Uh, We asked um, Doris Barnes who works there. Well, what if this coach doesn't work out? You know, can we switch? Can we get a different coach? And, and she said, Oh, I'm I'm pretty sure this is going to work, but you sure if, if this doesn't work, we'll switch you to somebody else. And she couldn't have put us with, somebody better than Kevin. He has become our friend, just like our customers have. And, and um, he's just been awesome. So a good match is key. Boy, you're right. Uh, you know, we've had Bob Cooper on the show before. He did a, just an excellent episode with us. Anyone just needs to go to the site and type in Bob Cooper and see it from Elite Worldwide. If you had to summarize one single takeaway from your coaching experience, what would it be? Business. Claim symbol, that word business. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, we, you know, it's so funny because even, even friends of mine, they'll say, they'll make comments all the time. They go, man, you've got that business. It just fine tuned it. It's just running like a well-oiled machine. I come up there and everybody knows their task. Everybody knows their jobs. Everybody's working. And they're like, Brent, you're not, you know, you're not all frenzied out with your hair on fire, running around from A to B. You're totally relaxed. We're sitting down there talking, but everybody else has just got their jobs and they're doing their job. It runs like a business. It's not a repair shop. Same with you, Brenda. Yeah. And I like the quote, the key to a business is to keep and create a customer. So it's a business, but it's customer and employee centered because um, they both go hand in hand and you if you don't have a customer and you don't keep that customer, then you don't have a business. So it all works together. Do you think we have a technician shortage? Huh. <laughs> Does, yes. Has anyone ever said no? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I guess I guess I love asking that tongue in cheek like I do anymore. <laughs> yeah. because I seem to incite a, you know a reaction just like you gave me. What's the answer? I think we need to, like I said, one of the things that we've tried to do uh, is as an industry, shop owners in general need to make a commitment to saying, hey, we're going to grow internally and and try to grow a technician. Um, I had a guy that uh, I had working for me when he was going to UTI, uh, 18 months worked as a GS, then full-time as a GS, uh, then started working doing heavy line, ended up working for me as a technician for nine years. Um, you know, was, uh, you know, master certified, got, you know, was a good technician, worked for me for a lot of time, a lot of years, uh, made, made good money working there. Um, uh, we have to be able to grow them and we can't expect to always just hire away from someone else. We do that. We, we think we can go hire somebody away. Where are you going to find the entry level? Are you going to go to high school? You're going to go to the colleges and take a two-year degree person, bring them in and do the grow your own? 
Yeah, what we've done is we've uh, we've worked closely with uh, Universal Technical Institute (UTI). They have a they have a one right here in Houston, and uh, so we work. Uh, we we have guys that come in and they'll work about thirty hours a week, and we'll have several of them that work. And we also work with the Lone Star College, uh, their College of Automotive uh, Technology, and we hire those guys. Uh, a lot of them. Um, end up finding by working in the shop, they end up changing and saying, I, I think this is not for me, uh, you know, and, uh, and you start figuring out real quick, like, you know, hey, this, this one, you know, this is a good one. This one has got a, a he's got a sharp mind and he's bright and he's got the aptitude and, and, uh, I, you know, and invariably, uh, you know, we've got a guy named, right now named Ricky and uh, that's where he's at. He's, uh, He's just totally on fire, excited about the, the industry. Uh, he's graduated from UTI, was general service, and I'm just eating up any, you know, if I say, hey, I want to send you to this class, just get yeah, whatever, boss, I'm ready to go. I mean, he's just on fire and he's going to be a, he's going to be a good tech. Uh, you know, it may take a few years, but he will, he will be that. So I think that we have to make that commitment as shop owners for the industry to say, we're going to grow them. We're going to help grow them. They can't, they, they don't just, pop out and instantly become L1 master certified techs. They, they don't. Uh, no matter what school they go to, they are still green as they can be. We got to make a commitment that, that at least one guy back there is going to be that apprentice. One guy is going to be that guy that's going to be learning. So we're going to have to grow them and, uh, you know, and let them learn a good culture and let them learn that uh, it's a good, you know, it, you know, automotive, it's a good field. They can make a good living. Uh, and, uh, you know, and there are, you know, places that, that they can work. Bottom line is they can work in any city in America because there's a shortage. If they decide they want to move to Denver tomorrow, well, they'll have a job in a week. It's a great industry to work in because they're never going to be out of work. At least not, not, I don't think so. Not in the foreseeable future anyway. So good to hear you say that. What a champion. It was, it was almost ev evangelical to hear your passion on that. Thank you for that. Yeah, well, it's just, you know, like I said, we just have to make sure we don't rely on other people. We just need to, we just need to all take the bull by the horns and do it and just train them and the industry will grow. So, Brent, you said you're a numbers person. What's your favorite KPI that you always look at? Well, we look at our numbers every week and do a performance report every week. And Brent is, is great at that. That's something that he didn't really have to learn in, in, in finance. So, I mean, he looks at, what, 27 different categories a week oh, or something every, like that. There's not one, as you're saying, that sticks right out. You're just looking for the balance, right? What, I'm, what I look for every week is the one that's lacking. So, like, for example, uh, we, we have a thing we call TARO, or Technical Average Repair Order. And what that Technical Average Repair Order tells me is how much were discovered services that needed on that vehicle. I know what that number needs to be per car. And if I see that dip one week, I don't get a concern. But if I see it two weeks, then we have a meeting because it tells me the guys out back are getting lazy and they're not checking cars out. If I look and I see our gross profit margins, we've got a, we've got a target that we want, but we've got a minimum. If that happens to fall below, then I know the guys behind the counter aren't working uh, the pricing matrix like they're supposed to. So I just look at whatever number is off is what is the important number. And so we just look at every one of them across the board. And uh, most of the time, I will tell you, most of the time I'll, I'll print it up and I'll print it up for the manager and the assistant manager. And I'm like, numbers look perfect. And they know what every one of those numbers are supposed to be. They see them, they know. Uh, and, uh, you know, now it's kind of nice because I'll say, do you see anything we need to work on there? And they're like, oh, we got to work on checkouts because we're not checking them out right because that number's a little low. And I'm like, there you go. Thank you for that. Starbucks. Everybody says, hey, did you ever get that Starbucks feeling? What have you done recently to give your customers that Starbucks feeling in your place? I think come a, coming from a woman's perspective, when I go to some place, I want it to be nice. I want it to be clean. I want the atmosphere to be nice. And so that's what we've tried to do in the past uh, year, year and a half. We remodeled the interior of our office and and um, created, we always had a nice waiting room, but we updated it. We created an iPad bar where customers can come in and and use our Wi-Fi, their kids. We have little, uh, you know, kids games on the apps, on the iPads. And so it keeps the kids busy. Um, we have, you know, our, our uh, just drinks and water and tea and, you know, lemonade, things like that, that they can uh, choose from. Just make the experience a nice, pleasant experience. Our bathrooms are super clean. The whole, the whole office is very nice. And 
I think more and more shops are doing that. It's definitely come a long ways from the way it used to be with repair shops, but I think that's important. What are you guys doing to retain customers? Well, I think ultimately you have to be basically genuine and you have to be honest and you have to have integrity and integrity can't be a buzzword. It has to be for real. I think that if you have that, the retention part kind of takes care of itself. Uh, like, you know, I, I've one of our assistant service writer, he's, you know, I told him, I said, I said, I want you this week to practice an open-ended question. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, I want an open-ended question with every customer that comes in. He goes, well, what's an open-ended question? What do you mean? I said, how, uh, how are you doing today? Or, uh, oh, you've got three kids. How are the kids doing? Are they getting ready for school uh, at Christmas time? Well, have you done your Christmas shopping? Are you ready for Christmas? Anything. It doesn't matter. Start the dialogue. Start the relationship. If you build the relationship, then the trust will come because they feel they get to know you as a person and not just someone behind the counter. And I said, that's, that's how you retain customers. I mean, you can, you can market, market gets them in the door, but how you treat them once they're in the door is what gets them coming back through the door. I, uh, I learned a, a great way to teach someone what open-ended questions were like. And those are questions that doesn't require a one word answer. Yeah. Well, and it doesn't require the person asking the question to give any input at all. <laughs> right. Yeah. Shake my head. Yeah. Mm, yeah that's a yes. <laughs> what has you two fired up right now? Oh, I think it's still a, a, the challenge of continuing to see our business grow and, and, and become the best it can be. I, I like the, um, the way the industry is going. I actually, uh, really see a lot of positive in that. Um, and from, from getting new technicians and training them and getting people interested in coming into this industry again, I think we're going to start seeing that. I mean, when there's a demand for it, you're going to start seeing the interest to, to get into the business. And I think the, the level of, uh, or the quality of people that are going to want to become technicians is, is risen because they're going to have to be, um, technologically, um, more advanced in, in the computers and electronics. And, and so you're going to get a quality of people that are really smart and, and excited about this field. I'm excited about that. I'm excited to see uh, where we can take our business um, and how far we can grow it. Uh, it. There's a lot of possibilities and and I'm excited about it. What's got you fired up, Brent? You know, I think for me, um, it's, it. Uh, yeah, and this is going to sound crazy. It's not about making more money. It's not about that. What is what really gets me excited on a day to day basis is trying to get this business to get to the maximum level it can get. You know, and it's not. I, I don't care if we make more money. I just want it. I want it to be absolutely the best run, the smoothest operation, maximizing. If we've got ten bays in our shop. And I want to, I want to be able to maximize that growth. And we're not there and, and we're not where we should be. It's, it's got, there's plenty of room for growth. How close are you? I think by nature, I don't know if I'll ever get there. I don't know that I'll ever be satisfied. <laughs> that sounds like uh, you. All I've, I, you know, what I've heard from the last 40 minutes is that your once you reach, you know, that summit, you put something on top of the mountain. Am I right, Brenda? Yes, that's exactly, that's it. That's Brent in a nutshell. And I think it's rubbed off on me. Brent's like that about everything he's ever done. So if he wants to do a hobby, he's going to be the best at that hobby. Um, if he want, and, and he's, his hobbies have been very wide, <laughs> wide range from cowboy mounted shooting to singing barbershop quartet. And he has to take it to the level where he's competing nationally. I mean, that's just how he is. Mm -hmm. So for our shop, it's the same thing. You know, we, we keep trying, we, you know, we have a lot of room for growth, but we keep trying. How cool is that? If I was an employee, I'd want to work for a guy like you. If I was a customer, I'd want to take my car to you. That's nice. Brenda, what advice would you give to a 30 year old you? I would say get as much training and education and, and, uh, knowledge as you can seek advice from people that know more than you do. Um, be passionate about what you do. You know, we have to balance uh, as a mom and, and working, there's a lot of balancing going on. So I've always tried to keep that in perspective. Our families always come first. 
So even though there's been times where I've wanted to work more and do more for the business, I've I put my family first. I would still tell a 30-year-old me to do that. I have no regrets about that. <laughs> and then work smart. Use your time wisely. You know, there's a way to to plan and prepare and make priorities um, fall into place from what's important, what's best, better, and, and uh, good. And I just try to live my life like that. Brent, if you had a chance to give a TED Talk, what would it be about? I, I guess I would have to say honesty and, and integrity, because I think it's too lacking in the world today uh, and our industry, especially. I think we have a, I think this industry, um, it, you know, not coming from this industry, you know, I've been on the other side of the counter. And so I know what customers think when they come into auto repair shops. And I know the black eye that this industry, it well deserved has, has gotten. Uh, not everybody uh, and the vast, I like to think the vast majority are not like that, but the small minority uh, that put profits uh, ahead of people, uh, they just give us a black eye. I, I think if I was talking to a 30-year-old me, I would probably, you know, tell a 30-year-old that, because that's about when I opened my business, I think I was 33. I would just, I would tell me, build a business that you can be proud of. Be, build a business that that you can be proud of because of the way it it runs itself and hire people uh, that are, that are basically good people uh, that, that, that stand for something and want to do things for the right reasons, have those people working for you and have a business that stands for the right things. I, I think, I think if you can do that, the rest kind of will fall into place. I think. Own your dream car. Uh, I, yeah. I, I like the car that I drive a lot. Uh, I have a BMW 435 and, it's uh, kind of the best between having a car that you can drive around every day, but yet it's when I want to go fast, it can go fast and it handles great <laughs> and that drives good. And I, I like it. It's a, it's a fun car. Probably maybe not my dream car, but, uh, but uh, you know, I said, I, I, I like BMWs and I said, I, w- I want an M6, but I just can't, I, I just can't, I just can't cut loose to spending that much money for a car. But not after what I've learned about you. <laughs> I, just, I just can't do it. I just can't do it. But that would how probably much? be my dream how car. Much? How much? Yeah. How much? <laughs> yeah. How much? No, no, Brenda, do you have your dream car? I like cars, but I am a functional type person. So for me, we have grandkids and I still drive a QX56 uh, Infinity and Nice car. It has to fit. Good it has car. to fit a lot of people. Oh, it's a great yeah. car, yeah. Oh, she she yeah. would drive a minivan if I would let her. <laughs> really no, no, no. Much. No, 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 no. <laughs> Not that. There but goes I did that have one. Soccer mom. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I've had a blast. Learned so much about you both, Brent and Brenda O'Neill, Repair One Automotive in the Woodlands, Texas. Thank you so much for being on. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Brenda and Brent O'Neill, for sharing your business insights and remarkable results. Here's hoping that you got a cup full of inspiration from this interview and you will engage one of the ideas that inspired you. Now, for more on Brenda and Brent O'Neill, go to the episode's show notes page at remarkableresults.biz slash E249. And thank you for joining us. Any questions or comments, email me at carm at remarkableresults.biz or head over to the contact page on the website. Hey, I love connecting people that need and want knowledge in a way that's easy to digest in their day-to-day life. Nothing better than the evergreen and on-demand aftermarket wisdom that is compiled every week in the RemarkableResults.biz content library. Hey, share this rich resource with your friend. There's a lot to go around. It's easy. Email the episode link, share my Facebook page, Twitter account, or LinkedIn connection. You know, I am grateful and thankful for your support. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time, 